So just a couple of quick announcements this morning. Uh, first off, we have the uh, we have the Diners Club sign up out in the lobby. Uh, I noticed the page is looking pretty blank, but uh, so take some time today on your way out to sign up for that. Um, just a reminder for uh, after the service today, we have a leaders um, leadership check-in. But along with that, uh, we'd like to invite anybody who's involved in the ministry who's actually serving to be a part of that meeting. There's a lot of things that we'd like to discuss. Um, so. March 19th, we talked about this last week. There's a men's chili cook-off in, in Fenton. If anyone here would like to be a part of that, um, come see if you can beat the king. Um, <laughs> and also, just a reminder that the second Saturday Sister Supper is on March 9th. A few ladies would like to be a part of that. Um, one of the things that I'm pretty excited about this morning, Mike, can you throw up that video for me or that screen? So an opportunity came our way this week, um, and Pastor Chris pulled the trigger on it. It's called Right Now Media. And there's like 20,000 different videos of um, different topics of the Bible, some great leaders, um, you know, as far as, um, you know, that are, are in mainstream Christianity. Uh, there's like 2,000 kids' videos in there just for their pure entertainment. All of this is free to everyone who comes to the road. Okay, this week you'll be getting uh, an email, so it's not spam, if it comes from Right Now Media. It'll be getting e uh, an email that's inviting you to sign in and set up your password and that kind of thing. This is something that um, we, we talked, Pastor Chris and I talked about, that could be a huge benefit to not only the fuel groups, but to our own personal study and enhancement as far as learning, you know, learning more about the Word of God. So that's, uh, that's pretty exciting. I'm really happy to see that come around. Um, and then there's one other announcement or just thing I want to talk about this morning is um, when Melanie and I were doing a field group, we used to have a time, and we call it, we, we did God stories, okay? We just took a minute to talk about what God was doing in our lives, answered a prayer, um, and I've been kind of wanting to do that, but I just really didn't know how to interject it into the morning service. And so it's just been mulling around in the back of my head. And then, like, last week when Chris was doing announcements, he mentioned that, you know, answered the prayer, you know, and that how we seldom talk about what God's doing in our life, how, he's, how God has worked things out. And so I thought, let's, let's give that a try. You know, one of the reasons that we used to do God's in our uh, fuel group was it's just as an encouragement to our faith. You know, uh, the Bible tells us that, they overcame him, referring to the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And to me, that's one, we need to give God the glory for what he's doing. Amen? Wow, that was really weak. We need God, give God the glory for what he's doing. Amen? There you go. But also, when we share how God's worked in our lives, that gives our brothers and sisters a chance to be encouraged and uplifted. You know, and it kind of puts you in a spot of going, hmm, God did that for them. He can do it for me, too, because we all know that God is no respecter of persons. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, who wants to go first? God's story. Hit it, Nick. That's awesome. Thank you, Jesus. All right, there's one. I know it takes a little bit to get people warmed up. My brother-in-law had a stroke, a pretty bad one, and he's over in Providence, Southfield. And they were looking for a place for him. They ended up putting him in another place in Southfield. And now it's like we're in a courthouse, like where they have him. And we're all praying. Bring him out here. Awesome. Praise the Lord. He has night terrors. Okay. It's horrible night terrors. He's got Parkinson's. Okay, so we need to pray for that. Yeah. And they can't seem to figure out these night terrors. It's just 
you're able, like people are coming in and <coughs> this has been going on for a long time. Okay. So a new um, person was put, physician's assistant, was put on a case in Wisconsin saying, he says, how long have you been on that black mask? And Paula said, a long time. And he says, has it changed? She goes, no, it was at the time it took her. That causes nightmares. Oh, wow. That's amen. There you go. One more. One more. God's good. Don't everyone speak at one time now. It's like it's like you're embarrassed of each other or something. Cool. Amen. Amen. So <clears throat> one of the things that I want to share real quick, I got a chance to share this in um, Fenton a few weeks ago. I'm sorry, I got to get myself organized. Um, everything in its place and a place for everything. Um, so a few weeks back, I celebrated her birthday. And, you know, as people do, you get these notices on Facebook, you know. Um, one of the ones uh, that I got was from a young man who was in my youth group 40 years ago, maybe. Um, and he commented that I was a great mentor then, and, I, and he's still using the things that I taught him today. And that was, because you know, sometimes when you're, when you're, in, the, the, you know, when you're in serving, you kind of get focused on what's in front of you, and you forget about the past. And that was just a huge encouragement for me. And then he, he goes on to, well, the rest of the story I guess I could share is that he's in the ministry. So what God poured through me got to him, and then there's the trickle-down effect that he's giving to other people. And that's, that's such a blessing to me, such a word of encouragement. And so I just encourage you this morning, too, that we have to live in the present, right? But we can't forget what God has done for us in the past. Because God is faithful, and he will always be there to see you through whatever storm or whatever trouble that you might be going through. And that's, I won't, nah, there's a lot more I could say, but that's, that's it. So uh, let's get started this morning. As, as I was preparing, because I knew that this, this moment was coming. Oh, Kids Quest. <laughs> see, I put that in my notes, and then I put my notes away. So... <laughs> Note to self, don't put your notes away until you're done. Um, I, I knew this morning was coming several weeks ago, and I, in the moment, I thought I knew what I wanted to share. You know, and it was going to be a time for me to break away from my normal style of messages, you know, one that's kind of really driving and you almost like, warn everybody that they need to wear their steel-toed shoes because you're going to be stepping on their toes kind of thing. Um, and I thought, well, you know, this time I'll be more scholarly and, and you know, really dig into, you know, the word. However, God took me from where I thought I was going to a place where he wanted me to be. And honestly, there is no other place that I'd rather be but in the middle of God's perfect will. There was a movie that came out in, the two, in 2000 called The Replacements. It's one of my favorites. If you've seen it, don't judge me. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, I can sum it up as this. There's a bunch of football players that are given a second chance to play a game that they love. It's kind of an underdog story. As the movie is coming to the closing moments, the, the players are in a huddle and... You know, there's like there's like this no win situation. And the quarterback looks at everybody and goes, I wish I could say something classy and inspirational. But that just wouldn't be our style. Pain heals, chicks dig scars, glory lasts forever. It's an honor sharing the field of battle with you. So I'm gonna steal part of that quote. 
I wish I could say something classy and inspirational. That's just not my style. <laughs> I am who I am this morning, and I just pray that um, although I might not take you deep into the Greek and the Hebrew, but I am going to challenge you to make you think. Pray with me. Father, I thank you so, so, so very much for this morning. Father, that we can be here to worship you, to honor you, to glorify you. Father, that we can be amongst family and friends, Lord God, that we can just relax in your presence today. And Father, I thank you so much that your word is alive and it's true in each and every one of us. And Lord, that we have God's stories to share, Lord, that we could be an encouragement to one another, Lord, and that we could just focus on the good things that you bring to our lives. Father, I pray that as I share this message this morning, these words that you put in my heart, Lord, that it's not me, but your Holy Spirit has given the inspiration that you would just fill my mouth with the words that you want your children, your people to hear today. Lord, I thank you so much, and I give you all the glory this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. There's no arguing that, that faith is important to every believer. You know, and it's not, it should say just important, but it's necessary. The Bible tells and refers to faith over 300 times in the pages of the Old and the New Testament. But what exactly is faith? We can't see it. We can't feel it. We can't taste it can't measure it, but yet we know it's real. The Bible tells us that God has given us, every one of us, a measure of faith. We find that in Romans chapter 12. The Bible refers to faith being weak at times. That's in Romans 14. Faith can be powerful. It can move mountains, as Jesus told us, and we find in Matthew 17. We are told to pursue it, 2 Timothy chapter 2. We are told to live by it. Faith comes, we walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are told to demonstrate it in the book of James chapter 2. And we're also encouraged to stand firm on it, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Most importantly, we need to understand that faith is a necessity to our lives. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, that we cannot even please God without faith. So faith has this, this dominant part of our lives as we serve Christ. You know, with all these verses that refer to faith, if you look at those, you would think that would be enough just to stimulate the believer to be well acquainted with, this, with that subject. If you're not, where would you start? To me, it's simple. If God expects us to have something, then he's not going to hide the answer from us. There must be a reference in the Bible, and there is. It's found in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It, says, it clearly says that faith is. Great, here we go. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. There you go. We all can go home now. We're done. That's We know what faith is. Yeah, but not so much. It's kind of muddy. It's not just like in your face kind of a definition that, that somebody like myself would want a, a, a simpler answer to. If we pursue in the natural... Go to the dictionary. What's faith? It says, faith is a confidence or trust in a person or thing without proof, and then, quote, unquote, like God. I love how sometimes our world just discards God. It's all oh, like God. According to some of the articles I read on, on the Internet, faith is, not based, or faith is based on whether or not you believe in God. But is that true? See, a common misconception is that belief and faith 
are interchangeable. But there are important differences. You know, James warns us, chapter 2, verse 19, he says, You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and they shudder or they tremble. Believing is not enough. One way to understand the distinction between faith and belief is to consider how they relate to knowledge and to evidence. Belief is a mental decision that something is true or real based on information that can be proven. Faith expresses confidence or trust or commitment to someone without requiring proof. Belief can be held in different aspects of life, such as science, politics, history, while faith is primarily associated with religion. Belief may or may not influence one's behavior or worldview, depending on how strongly it is held. Faith, on the other hand, implies a transformation of one's life or outlook based on the object of faith. In our case, that's God. Faith will transform your life based on who you and where you place it. As believers, we proclaim a faith that in God, the Father, Jesus' his Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our faith is based on who he is, what we know of him, and know what we know of his nature and character, and all the experiences that we have with him. Let me repeat that. Faith will transform your life based on where you place it. As believers, we proclaim that we have faith in God the Father, Jesus' his Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our faith is based on who he is, what we know of his nature and character, and our experience with him. You know, you can own a, what I would call a saving faith. One that is just enough to get you into heaven. You know, we believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, and we ask for forgiveness. That gets you started, and that gets you in. That's what I would refer to as what they would say, a measure of faith. But how do we go from having that measure of faith to a powerful faith, a mountain-moving faith, one that Jesus said that we could possess? We have to admit that this is a, it's, it's a road, it's a process. It's like planting a seed you know, and nourishing it until it becomes fruit or it bears fruit. You know, but this takes work. You cannot simply drop a seed in the ground and leave it. It needs to be watered, nourished, and protected. If you're not careful, weeds will come in and compete for the nutrients in the soil, making it weak and potentially killing it. Our journey towards a growing faith goes something like, like this. And for everybody, this will be different. One, it starts with accepting that he is and learning about the things that he has done as we read his word. From there, we start to trust him. We pray. We watch the ways he works in our lives. Then we can move on to see um, how he has, his actions has caused us to grow and believe in him for more, and we learn more about his nature and his character. We have to work at it, and we have to protect all the things that we take in because as weeds can infect your garden, so can things of life affect our faith and our process of growing faith. You know, from as we protect it and we learn more about it, we'll begin to, like, yield our old ways, our old, old habits, our ways of thinking, and start to accept his ways. And soon after that, our desires, the things that we thought were important, will start to fade, and we start to mimic or, or mirror who and what he is, his mission. We have to remember what Jesus was questioned about why he was here on the earth. He said that he came to seek and save the lost. He was on a mission. He had a purpose to redeem this world. So where are you in the process? Are you sitting back comfortable with a, a saving faith, which is good, 
Or are you on your way to pursuing a mountain moving faith? Do you want to deepen your relationship with God today? If you do, you need to ask yourself some hard questions. How well do you know him right now? How much effort have you put into growing closer with him? Do you read the Bible every day? And if you are, are you applying the things that you're learning? Do you pray regularly? And, and I'm not just saying praying as in asking for things, but do you share your thoughts and your feelings with him? Do you take time to recognize what he's doing for you now? Do you take time to thank him for the things that he's done? You know, there's ways to level, level up your relationship and understanding of who God is. And with that, you'll begin to see more clearly of how God cares and how much he wants for you. So imagine you're meeting me for the first time. My name is Matt Robinson, and that's all you know about me. How would you relate to me? Would you trust me with personal information? Would you believe me if I told you something important? Your level of knowledge of me affects your level of interaction with me. You might want to know more about me, such as maybe what type of car I drive, what's my wife's name, where do I live, and so on. These are all basic facts that can help you form that first impression. But there's more to me than that. You might also want to know what are my hobbies, what are my preferences, what are my values, and so on. These are deeper aspects that can help you understand my personality and my character. And then there are deeper aspects as to where did I get my ordination from? What is my greatest achievement or failure? What's, what are my dreams? See, these are intimate details that can help you connect with me on a deeper level. The more you know about me, the more you can trust me and rely on me, and the more you know about me, the more confidence you will have in me. As you can see, there are different levels of knowing someone, and each level changes the relationship. That is exactly what happens with us and God. The more you know him, the deeper that relationship uh, becomes. And as you learn more about God's character and attributes and promises, you'll be able to trust him and depend on him. As you discover more about God's power, wisdom, and love, you'll be able to grow in confidence and assurance that he is with you, and he is for you. You may not realize it this morning, but there's more than names than just labels in the Bible. They reveal something about each person's identity and purpose. Joshua, the name Joshua means the Lord saves. Ruth means loyal friend. David means beloved God's names also tell us something about who he is. They describe his attributes and actions, his personality, and his power. One way to grow in our knowledge of God and to trust him in a, in a greater way is to study some of the names that are used. And, and I just list a few examples this morning. Oh, I say a few, but there's like nine. Um, Elohim. In Hebrew, the name of God appears in the first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created heavens and earth. The name reveals God as creator and ruler of all things, who has the power to bring something together out of nothing. It also implies the, God's triune nature of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Soak it in for a moment. The God who stands outside of time and space, who created the universe out of nothing. This is the God that we serve. This is the God who is invested in our lives. The God of unlimited power cares about us so much that he even knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows us. There's Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. And this is one of the names that speaks of his character of being a faithful and loving provider who cares for his people and he meets their needs. 
He is the source for everything that we need. And he invites us to trust and depend on him. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals or the Lord who restores. It reveals God's power and compassion to heal us physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. It shows us that God is not distant or indifferent to our sufferings and our pain, that he is intimately involved in our healing and restoration. Jehovah Rapha is a name used for God that is found throughout the Old and New Testament in countless stories of his miracles and his promises. He is a God who fixes broken things. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner, or the Lord is my victory. This name reveals God's character as our protector, our leader and provider. He defends us from us, our enemies, and he grants us the victory over and over again. He is the origin of our strength and our hope. And we can trust him in his leadings no matter what the situation. Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is my shepherd. This comes from the 23rd Psalm, and, and it, it speaks of God's care and guidance and provision for his people is similar to that of a shepherd. It shows God's love and protection for his flock. It reveals God's personal relationship with each and every one of us. It reminds us of the story that Jesus told, how the good shepherd leaves the 99 and seeks the one that is lost and is hurting. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is my peace. This brings an assurance that God is not, our, not, is not only our source of peace after the trial, but he's our source of peace when we're going through the struggle. El Shaddai, God Almighty. It reveals God's power and sufficiency and his majesty, the creator of heaven and earth, protector of his people, guarding everything that they have need of. El Roy, he's the God who sees us. He's the God who sees us to the very finite depths of our soul. He's compassionate and he is attentive. He doesn't ignore our troubles or our struggles. He's not far away from us. He's not uncaring. He knows us intimately, personally. And he loves us with an everlasting love. So in all these words, you have Elohim, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rohi, Jehovah Shalom, El Shaddai, and El Roy. What does that add up to? Faith. These are the building blocks of our faith, our foundation. Knowing God and his promises and, and witnessing how he's loved and provided and defended his people through all ages will cause us to rely on him in every situation. Every morning we wake up, and no matter if we acknowledge it or not, the God who created the universe, El Elohim, is there. And he's been watching over you while you sleep. When we prepare for our day, the God of the universe is there to guide, support, and direct. When we're in the midst of our day and struggles or battles or enemies are all around us, God is at your side to deliver you and give you victory. In the evening, he is there to comfort you and bring you peace. His promise to us is that he will never leave us or forsake us. And in knowing this, we can speak the words of Romans 8.31 and make them our own. If God is for me, who can be against me? I'll close with this. Praise team, if you're ready. Um, in the 27th Psalm, it's, it's believed that David wrote this in a time when he was running from Saul. Saul wanted to kill him. And you would think 
that David would be begging for God to deliver him. But this is what he wrote. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You have David, one individual, and the king of Israel with all of his armies seeking out David. And in that moment, David says, what do I got to be afraid of? Verse 2 says, When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon to eat my, my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp around me, my heart does not fear. Though war should rise against me in this, I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that I will seek, and that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to hold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up upon my enemies around me. Therefore I will offer up in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing the praises to the Lord. Would you stand with us and sing as we close out the service this morning?